Before we begin, check out this amazing straight out of Banbridge Francis Crozier t-shirt that I found at somewhere called Diamanda Hagen's Red Bubble. Badass or what? Anyway, part three. Unlike part two, where I repeated stuff in greater detail, this is all new information. I'm sure a couple of people have been wondering about this, so I'll start by saying that there was no escape plan drawn up in case the expedition went wrong. None. The Admiralty refused to accept the possibility of failure. The crews weren't even given locations to walk to in the event of being trapped deep in the ice. Now, many people complained vigorously about this, but they were all rebuffed. One of the men who sent letters was Dr. Richard King, the closest thing the Franklin expedition had to a prophet. I couldn't find a painting of him, so I'm going to represent him with pictures from Doctor Who for reasons that will become all too obvious. Richard King was a veteran of Arctic exploration, but he wasn't in the Navy. He had accompanied Sir George back on his journey down the river that bears his name, the same river that the Death March was heading for. Anyway, partially because of his lack of Navy background and partially because he was prickly as all hell, Dr. King's warnings were ignored. What warning? Though that it's crazy to send two giant, heavily manned ships into the polar ice. That if you want to run the Northwest Passage, you'll need a lightly equipped team of experts in a quick and small boat. Which is exactly what Roel Admanson, probably the greatest ever polar explorer, did when he became the first person to complete the passage in the early 20th century. And it still took him three years. Later on, most of the Admiralty concentrated their search in the far north. Partially because Franklin didn't leave a message Karen Beach Island to tell him of his plans, and partially because the passage where the expedition had sailed through was frozen solid by then. So it was assumed that they couldn't have gone that way. The search got so desperate in the high Arctic that they started trapping foxes and putting collars with messages on them before releasing them again, in the desperate hope that one of the lost men would find them. Apart from those who died, yes, men died in the search. The search who probably had it worst was Sir James Clark Ross, Crozier's best friend and the former captain of the Erebus. He was the only man of his day more experienced in polar exploration than Crozier. He was also pimp as fuck. They had spent four years exploring Antarctica together and Crozier was the best man at his wedding. Crozier was Spock to his Captain Kirk. Ross was the first choice to lead the expedition, but his new wife demanded that he retire from the Navy, leaving Crozier the most experienced polar explorer in the service. He came out of retirement to lead a fruitless search for his friend. It took a huge amount of badgering from the media, members of Parliament, and Lady Franklin herself to convince the Admiralty to admit that something might be wrong. The earliest searches began in 1848, when it was already too late. Years later, when they eventually stopped sending rescue ships and declared both crews dead, Lady Franklin sank her own family's money into further desperate attempts that obviously came up empty-handed. Anyway, before those searches had even begun, Dr. King was busy sending letters to the Admiralty telling them that the expedition had been frozen on the western side of Somerset Island. Not exactly King William Island, but close enough to be really impressive. And those letters were sent in 1847, early enough that the bulk of the men had yet to die. Dr. King also said that trying to rescue them with ships would be folly as we trapped too deep into the ice, and the only possible way to rescue them would be by sending fast-moving relief teams up Bax Fish River, the exact place Crozier was heading. King was later assigned to the rescue effort on the HMS Resolute, which is a nice segue into the Franklin Expedition, the UK, and the USA. Okay, I've mentioned that HMS Terror was a warship. Well, it was launched in 1813, and its earliest career was in the War of 1812, because that war lasted more than just 1812. Anyway, one of the battles it took part in was the bombardment of Fort McHenry. Yes, the one that inspired the Star Spangled Banner. Years later, it gets converted into an exploration ship and is lost, and the HMS Resolute enters the picture. You see, the Admiralty eventually sent a bunch of ships looking for the expedition. As luck would have it, never to the right place. Now, you can't send a bunch of wooden ships into the most remote parts of the Arctic without problems, so many of them ended up frozen. Men died, and ships were lost. Most of the abandoned ships were crushed, but the Resolute was salvaged by some American whalers who brought it back to the States. There it was repaired, and after an act of Congress, it was sailed to the UK and handed over to Queen Victoria herself as an act of friendship. Remember, the UK and the USA had fought two wars in the last 80 years. They were serious rivals in many areas. This was a big deal. Anyway, after more years of service, the Resolute was decommissioned, and some of its timbers were used to make a desk. A desk that was given to the American people as a sign of friendship the Resolute desk that normally sits in the Oval Office. So isn't that nice? Anyway, back to the horrors. We know the walk south was a suicide mission, but what many people don't know is how surprised people were when the news of the march got out. You see, northeast, and after a much shorter journey, lies Fury Beach, where the HMS Fury was wrecked 15 years before and where a huge cache of food and supplies were left. And it was right off a popular whaling area. So why did they go south? Crozier and Franklin's peers eventually concluded that there must have been something else they weren't aware of blocking their path. 
possibly huge walls of ice to the east that they just couldn't get past. Since then, the consensus why Crozier chose to go south has shifted somewhat. One, they didn't know for sure the supplies were still there, and Fury Beach was even more barren than King William Island, so possibly he felt he couldn't risk everything in assuming they were still there and intact. Two, if they were dying from botulism, then people were likely avoiding the canned food whenever possible, and that means hunting and scavenging, and there's nothing between them and Fury Beach. Three, if they had scurvy, which they almost certainly did, then the supplies wouldn't help. Fresh meat helps with scurvy, though not as much as fruit, and going south meant the possibility of hunting. There's no way they didn't know about the supplies, because the survivors of the Fury were rescued by the HMS Hecla, which had Crozier serving on it. Just so you know, the supplies in Fury Beach were later located and intact. You see, I described King William Island as desolate, and it is, but it's much worse in the north and west. But on the very southern end, there's animal life. Enough that Admonson and his men could throw meat away when they passed through while sailing the passage. So, why did so many men starve during the death march on the south side of King William Island? Well, they were physically wrecked by pulling tons of wooden gear, a job so strenuous that even if they were eating well, they were probably already starving. And if they weren't, the Admiralty hadn't thought of sending hunters or hunting equipment with them, let alone anyone with the experience to hunt Arctic wildlife. They had guns for the Marines, but it was the Victorian era. The guns were generally designed to shoot en masse into a load of men. Few were built for accuracy, and about as many would have the stopping power needed for many of the animals in the Arctic. On Beachy Island, a group of searchers killed a polar bear and discovered a several-year-old musket ball in its skin, fired by one of the Franklin Expedition. With what they had, they couldn't even get through its skin. And apart from all that, there were a hundred men at the start of the Death March. About forty were seen at the south side of King William Island. Even if every man was a skilled hunter, the area could not sustain a group that large. And whatever food they brought was not going to last forever. One of the great many things that sealed the expedition's fate was the belief that King William Island was part of the Canadian mainland. You see, it hadn't been properly mapped by this point. They had a choice after going south from Beachy Island. To assume this random piece of what passes for a map is wrong and waste precious time on going south and therefore discover the south coast, or assume the information is right and go around the north coast to find the route through to the Pacific. Remember, they're only a few hundred miles from the edge of the fully mapped out parts on the Pacific end. Anyway, that's what they did, and here's the terrible luck. The south side of King William Island, apart from having more animal and vegetable life, is a lot less prone to freezing for years at a time than the north side. If they'd gone south, then they may well have got through after a year or two in the ice and returned as heroes. Although, the strait separating King William Island from the mainland is very shallow and rocky, so likely they would still have had severe trouble. At the very least, they'd have more access to food and been closer to the nearest settlements. There was an interesting bit of research done recently. Tests were done on the bones of 24 sailors found in King William Island that indicated that four of them were women. Now, the bodies were definitely not Inuit, and while the tests don't quite have a 100% success rate, it's still pretty high. And women serving in the Victorian Navy was not unheard of. It's just if they were discovered, they were kicked out. Now, 129 people weren't the only crew aboard the Erebus and Terror. There were the unwanted shipmates of insects, rats, and whatnot, but also three ships' pets. A Labrador Terrier called Neptune, a monkey, a gift from Lady Franklin called Jacko, and a cat. There's no record of its name. According to a letter sent back from Greenland, the lobby was wonderful. Lieutenant Fairholme even went so far as to say, He's the most lovable dog I ever knew. Jacko, though, was far less popular, though Lady Franklin thought that dressing him up would be a source of great fun. Again, there's nothing about the cat. Now, we don't know what happened to these three, but we can guess, and it's not pretty. The crew, to a certain extent, knew what they were getting themselves in for, what dangers they faced. The poor animals, not so much. Now, back to years before the expedition, for something that's tangential, unless you realise that I'm trying to convince you that Crozier is the ironest wooby who ever lived. Long before he met Sophia Crackroft, he'd a short-lived and chaste romance with a poet called Jean Inglow, a woman so well regarded in the Victorian era that she was recommended to be the UK's first female poet laureate, and had Alfred Lord Tennyson as a fan. Anyway, years before either of them became noteworthy, they had their short romance, and afterwards Jean Inglow would write recurring mentions of a lost great love, a sailor who went to sea and never returned. Was that Crozier? I have no idea. Now for something a little lighter, the discovery of the HMS Terror. It was found in 2016 in excellent shape in Terror Bay. The bay was named before they found it there. It's like that lost Irish castle they found on Castle Street. Anyway, Sammy Kogvik, an Inuit hunter and Canadian ranger, joined up with the Arctic Research Foundation and mentioned an experience he'd had seven years earlier. He'd been out on the ice and seen a mass jutting out from it, in the middle of nowhere. He finally convinced some people to follow him to the location to take a look, and there was the terror. 
Apparently people have been ignoring the local information about its location for years because they were sure it was about 100 miles north. Now, polar archaeology is tricky and they usually only have a few months, if that, each summer to work, so it's going to be a big and slow job. But I'm hoping that documents that will shed more light on what happened will be recovered. One of the eeriest Inuit stories about the expedition is them visiting an abandoned frozen ship, going on board and finding a dead giant with rat-like teeth in a cabin. Sounds unlikely, but the white men tended to be taller than the Inuit and his lips could have pulled back after death. Regardless, I'm interested to see if any remains are found in any of the cabins. I'm going to end this with some unexpectedly tongue-in-cheek stuff. The terror is far from the first piece of pop culture to intersect with the Franklin Expedition. Stranger in a Strange Land by Iron Maiden is apparently about John Torrington, the first member of the cruise to die at Beachy. It's about a polar explorer who dies and is buried by his fellows, but his ghost is restless, waiting for them to return to take him home. Now to comics. Crozier is a Marvel Comics villain. It's true, he fought Alpha Flight. You see, either Bill Mantia or David Ross found out about the exhumation of the bodies on Beach Island and had an idea. What if Crozier wasn't the captain of the Terror, but the doctor and chief science officer? What if he took over after the death of Franklin Inouye and led the death march south, but out of desperation took a suspended animation potion he'd invented? You see, his plan was to pretend to be dead so his men would walk on without him and then wake up when the weather was better. But his men buried him out of respect and he was trapped in the permafrost for about 150 years, which drove him insane. You know, the sort of permafrost that you don't actually get that far south? Anyway, after causing all sorts of weirdness, he ends up possessing Snowbird's baby, calling himself Pestilence, and causing all kinds of trouble. That's about it for this video. If people want a part four, I'll tell you about the encounters between the Inuit and the crews as they headed south. 